There is a secret that most pro athletes, elite CEOs, and high performers all know. They all have a group of world-class coaches working for them to help them optimize their potential. At Super Athlete Radio, our goal is to provide you with the caliber of world-class coaches and guests to help you unlock your potential, dominate your industry, and dominate your life. Let's get better today. Welcome to Super Athlete Radio, where we're good today we are going to talk about Bob Marley, purposeful practice, and the best recovery strategies you can use to optimize your training and day-to-day performance. If you have not yet, if you have not yet followed us on YouTube or subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's Apple, iTunes, or Spotify, or another one, Amazon Music, maybe, uh, please do us a favor and do that. It is the fastest and easiest way to support the show, and it is totally free. I watched a great documentary last Friday night on Bob Marley, one of the greatest musicians of all time, and uh, one of the big takeaways I had from the documentary You know, when people think of Bob Marley, they think of incredible musician and also a big time marijuana smoker, you know, when he wasn't, wasn't, when he was not creating music, he was, you know, the stereotype was Bob Marley was just sitting on the couch smoking weed. And that could not have been further from the truth. What this documentary talked about was how active and disciplined uh, Bob Marley was in terms of creating his music. He ran every day, and then him and his uh, bandmates and other people within his circle that were working for him and with him were avid football players, soccer players, and they played uh, almost every day, and they were high-level games. And the reason I bring this up in this context and why I think it's valuable to this show was it it was a prime example of a world-class performer who utilized his uh, physical body to improve his performance in his craft and then also to instill a level of discipline that he could apply to all areas of uh, his life and his camp's life. He was, he was the leader, right? So he was the one getting people up in the morning to run. He was the one organizing the soccer games, making sure everybody played and you know, just the amount of impact that his music had on the world. This is one of the things the documentary showed is just absolutely inspiring. And, you know, this documentary showed that, you know, Bob Marley was a disciplined, a relentless, extremely hardworking, in shape athlete who used his gifts as a musician to become one of the most uh, impactful musicians in the history of the world. So I highly recommend that. And watching that documentary made me think of, you know, I've always been a very interested in how people get to world class. I've always been a huge fan of Anders Ericsson at Florida state. Uh, He wrote the book peak a few years ago. He became, uh, kind of he got into the cultural uh, forefront when Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers where he talked about 10,000 hours and what it takes to become an expert performer. Uh, Since then, that has been debunked. Uh, Anders Ericsson debunked it himself. The original 10,000 hours concept, what Gladwell said in the book was, hey, if you want to be, you know, world class at anything, you need to have 10,000 hours of practice. And he based that off Anders Ericsson's research. And Anders Ericsson's research looked at violinists. And it looked at violinists in terms of how many hours they practiced to become an expert. I think at like the age of 19 or 21 or something like that. So if they looked at violinists at 25 or 30, it would have been a different number. If they, looked, if they would have looked at violinists at 17, it would have been a different number. But the kind of overarching theme was that just practicing, you know, if 10 different people practice, whether that's a sport or a business skill or music, they're going to 
accelerate at 10 different levels. And that's based on, there's some, some genetics involved, of course, but also in terms of how they practice. And what I wanted to go over today was Erickson talked about purposeful practice. Now, the reason I'm talking about purposeful practice rather than deliberate practice is because purposeful practice for many of you listening who are not involved in world-class athletics, we do have a number of world-class athletes who are in our programs and who follow us at Super Athlete, but there's a ton of you uh, amazing men and women who are just high performers in society. And I wanted to apply uh, what you guys can do to get better in your specific craft rather than from an athletics or, you know, like music perspective. So the gold standard of practice is deliberate practice. And what this is, we're about to talk about what purposeful practice is, is essentially it's purposeful practice plus having a teacher and then you going through a very clear training program in an established field. So that's like, again, sports, music, chess, things like that. And there's a clear, clear, clear definition of what mastery looks like, right? LeBron James is a master at the game of basketball. Patrick Mahomes is the master at the game of football. With business, you know, you could say Elon Musk is a master at the game of business. There's a lot more ambiguity to it. Okay, so we're going to talk about purposeful practice. And purposeful practice has four specific components. And again, how, why I want to share this with you today is whatever it is that you want to improve, whatever it is that you do professionally, the goal is, okay, how can I apply this to my specific craft? And or, you know, if you're training or something competing along with that in a, in a sport or, you know, learning a musical instrument, how can I apply these things? Because it's going to lead to accelerated improvement. Number one, purposeful practice has well-defined specific goals. How specifically do you in, intend to improve in this practice session? What are you going to do to improve in this practice session with that specific goal in mind? And how you want to kind of view this is you need to identify what your long-term goals are, break it down into mini goals. And then in that particular practice session that day, break it into baby steps in pursuit of that goal, micro goals. It all starts with a specific goal, a target. This can also help you get into flow. Mihai Cheek sent me high is a, I think he won the Nobel prize, but incredible story. A scientist, he's the guy who came up with, with this concept of flow. And one of the components that get you into flow is having a clear target to aim. So having that is super important. Number two component of purposeful practice is that purpose, purposeful practice is focused. What Erickson talks about is that if we're calm, relaxed, you know, kind of just going through the motions, then we're not really practicing to the level that we want to practice that we're not practicing with intensity. We're actually about to do a episode tomorrow on how to uh, really improve your focus and doing that fast, because I think that is such a undervalued uh, skill attribute that is not taught in school. That's not talked about in the workplace, but the more we're able to focus the higher quality work that we're able to do. And then also it's just, it, transfers over to everything in life. So purposeful practice component number two is you need to be really focused. Number three, uh, purposeful practice involves feedback. You need to know how you are doing step by step. Did you miss a note playing that song that you want to play three times perfectly in today's practice session? Immediate feedback to help you identify what you're doing wrong and how you can improve is essential. And this is why mentors are so important in what we do professionally uh, outside of the sports realm and having people either at our level or above us in certain components in our businesses and our branding and things like that. So they can provide immediate feedback on what we're doing well and what needs to be improved. And it's got to be feedback from an external source. So that's number three. So you're focused. You're getting feedback, you have a clear target, 
And number four is a purposeful practice gets you out of your comfort zone. And in Eric's work, again, uh, Erickson's work, again, rest in peace, he passed away a couple years ago. Uh, he considered this maybe the most essential part of purposeful practice. He said, if you never push yourself beyond your comfort zone, you are never going to improve. Basically, what Erickson says is, so here we have purposeful practice in a nutshell. Get outside your comfort zone, but do it in a focused way with clear goals, a plan for reaching these goals, and a way to monitor your progress. Oh, and figure out a way to maintain your motivation. Daniel Coyle, who looked at talent hotbeds across the world in his book, The Talent Code, and he's also wrote some amazing uh, two other books, The Culture Code and Fifty Little The Book of The Little Book of Talent, Fifty Ways to Become Great at Something, basically what we're talking about here. And when he talks about getting out of your comfort zone, he, the the frame he uses is like you want to be getting like sixty to eighty percent right in your reps. So if you're getting less than sixty percent of your reps right, then it might be a little bit too challenging. If it's over eighty percent, then it would be too easy. So Again, that frame can be a little bit maybe challenging to view from a, let's say, like business improvement perspective, but it's I think it's a good reference point. Okay, so again, I highly recommend the Bob Barley doc, and I hope you guys check it out. And just watching it made me think of just the power of practice and training the right way, because there's tons of musicians that were in the space that Bob Marley was in. So how was he able to separate himself so profoundly from so many others? And he did that by a number of different reasons, but a couple of them where he really took care of his body. And also he was disciplined. And then also he knew how to do purposeful practice. Okay. The other thing that I want to share with you on the episode today was I, I read a great paper last week on recovery and how to optimize recovery. And it was written from an Australian uh, sports performance and nutrition research group, School of Allied Health in Melbourne, Australia. Australia has always, well, not sure, I don't know about always, but at least for the last few decades, has been amongst the leaders when it comes to sports science and sports performance. And the article just does a, a great job of explaining when it comes to recovery, like what's important and what is, I mean, or I should say what's super important and then what's like not as uh, important or the analogy they use, what's the cupcake and what is the icing? And the cupcake is sleep nutrition and periodization. And then the icing is stretching, hydrotherapy, active, reco active re recovery, cryotherapy chambers, EMS, compression garments, uh, photo biomodulation therapy, foam rolling, occlusion cuffs, inflatable sleeves, massage guns, float tanks, massage, saunas. So all of these things are good. And for many of you, like myself, we do a number of these, but understand that they're the icing. Most important is to get the sleep right, get your nutrition right, get your periodization right. So if you want to take an hour out of the day to recover faster from a workout, then you know don't stay up an hour later at night to get in the sauna. Or if you're going to you know, head to the cryotherapy chamber to recover. Don't eat some bullshit before you go in there because you're missing out on the big blocks that make up recovery uh, compared to what they call the icing. And I love how they describe it uh, because recovery can be, you know, such this big term that's used in all different kinds of uh, way, uh, excuse me, all different uh, contexts and different ways. And the way they describe it is training is the application of acute physical challenges to the body over time in order to maximize physio physiological capability. Recovery, therefore, is the time outside of training where these improvements in physiological capability will actually transpire. 
and must be carefully balanced with training stress, that's the other big piece of the cupcake. It's sleep, it's new training, it's training, it's periodization, which is the training stress to optimize performance while avoiding maladaptation, injury, or illness. All right, so here's the cupcake, here's the icing. The fundamentals of recovery. Athletes' perceptions of recovery methods do not align with current scientific evidence. And as such, athletes may, may overlook some of the more well-established methods of recovery in favor of new or no novel recovery technologies. Again, athletes are tip of the spear of this stuff, but if you are someone who trains and you are one of the high performers in our community, then you're going to want to know this as well, because if the tip of the spear people are doing this, then uh, you want to take from that. It takes just as so much time to learn from people in the middle. Why not learn from the best? While research evidence is weak or sparse on many of these newer technologies like massage guns, occlusion cuffs, and recovery boot sleeves, there is a greater level of emp empirical support for the fundamental recovery strategies of sleep, nutrition, and periodization and their role in athletic recovery. These fundamentals are the cake of the cupcake, and they have a much greater overall contribution to athletic recovery and performance than any other potential marginal improvements from added devices and tools, the icing, and therefore must be monitored and optimized before considering the implementation of fur further strategies or devices. You know, we talk about sleep a lot with super athlete and you know, it's something that, you know, many of you guys know by now what could be done to optimize your sleep. The question is, uh, are you doing it? Uh, for most people in our communities, what we found works is you stop eating earlier in the day, stay away from tech at night, specifically blue light, and then supplements that we have found helpful, tryptophan, melatonin. I'm not completely against melatonin like uh, many people are now. If you look at some of the top uh, melatonin uh, researchers in the world, uh, they take extraordinary amounts of melatonin. And they say, you know, melatonin is really good, despite um, the hearsay out there of it being preventing us from uh, by taking a external source of melatonin. That's going to prevent us from uh, creating our own. So take that how you like. If you find it beneficial, uh, run that experiment. Uh, cherry juice as well has been super helpful. And then also make sure you have a cool room. And also a hot shower before bed has been for most people when in our programs has been super helpful in terms of improving sleep, because what that does is your body is a signal to your body when you get out of the shower to rapidly lower body temperature. And we want a lower body temperature when it's time for bed. And that is why cold showers uh, work so well in the morning. Other piece of the cupcake is nutrition. Maintaining adequate dietary energy intake is paramount for athletes to promote energy availability for training and reduce the risk of injury and illness. Strategies for recovery nutrition will be sport and sex dependent, but the fundamentals are considered to be the following. Refueling, which they uh, recommend replacing carbohydrates after exercise. We just had uh, Bernie Wooster on the podcast yesterday who has a amazing starch that many top pro athletes are using as a potential uh, refuel after uh, training. It has been scientifically proven to uh, get to the muscle faster than any other carb, such as maltodextrin or dextrose. And also benefits of nutrition is you wanna meet these primary needs and ensure adequate nutritional intake, macro and micronutrients, to meet overall energy requirements, which should be first and foremost in nutrition planning. The use of certain nutritional supplements may also be encouraged to support training and competition demands with guidance from previous reviews that have categories, categorized evidence on these supplements. In terms of nutrition, you know, high level principles we talk about consistently, you know, eliminate the seed oils, minimize sugar and eliminate flour while food allergy tests can be of benefit. Those can, in my experience, in our experience working with clients, can be a little bit hit or miss. You know, so if you really want to find out what is potentially inflaming you, then 
a elimination diet is a fantastic strategy to apply. We have, uh, that's one of our protocols that we have some of our clients do within super athlete training camp by eliminating everything except the few foundational basics that for the majority of people do not uh, cause inflammation and then slowly bringing things back in. You can really see what foods are impacting your energy, your mood, your focus, your ability to sleep and whatnot. And then periodization, which is so important. And, you know, for those that are going to the gym to go to the gym, you know, as a, as a break from business and our work, then, you know, that's great. But for those that really want to get specific benefits from their training, there must be some kind of periodization. Structured physical training is based upon the principles of progressive overload and adaptation, whereby an increasing training stimulus is applied over time to elicit fit physiological adaptations and improvements in performance. So that can be an increase in weight, an increase in reps, an increase in intensity. Training load comprised of training volume, intensity, and frequency must be manipulated appropriately over microcycles weeks, mesocycles months, and macrocycles seasons to maintain or improve physiological capabilities. Planning recovery within and across these cycles is necessary and should consider the characteristics of individual training sessions. So, you know, this is one of the benefits of having a coach. This is one of the benefits of having a trainer because then you don't have to focus on that. You know, you can just go and just do what is outlined for you. And then you don't have to think about all that. And then the article goes into all of the icing strategies. So we'll go through these briefly. Uh, foam rolling. Foam rolling is a form of self-massage. Foam rolling appears to reduce DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, and increased pressure to pain thresholds. Very few studies have shown that increased our range of motion or decreased DOMS translates to athletic performance following foam rolling as a recovery strategy. So it could help you, you know, make you feel a little bit better, but it's not necessarily going to improve your performance in the gym. Compression garments. As with foam rolling, there's little to no reported detriments to recovery or performance that have been report reporting with the use of compression garments. And okay, so there's no downside. And it looks like they have shown increased blood flow during recovery. I've seen data that shows uh, wearing compression garments can improve vertical jump. So shout out to compression garments, huge advocate of wearing compression garments while traveling. Uh, there's so many things you want, you can do to mitigate uh, jet lag and just feeling like shit getting off the airplane and compression garments are one of those things. Uh, EMS, electric muscle stimulation, I found this very beneficial to do at night. I never looked at it as like a recovery strategy, though. I looked at it as a training strategy. And they say about EMS is, in a 2014 review of 13 EMS studies, authors reported that only one study showed a performance recovery benefit and four showed a benefit to perceived muscle or pain or exertion. So about one out of every three people found it beneficial to recovery. In my experience, uh, I have found that it is a more of, it's causing more stress than recovery on the body. So it can be used as a stimulus and then you want to recover from the EMS rather than using the EMS as a recovery strategy. Cryotherapy has some good stuff on here. A more recent review of 16 studies reported that muscle pain was reduced in 80% of studies investigating the use of WBC cryotherapy immediately after damaging exercise. However, it's also worth considering that cold water immersion has been shown to offer compar comparable physiological and performance recovery benefits to cryotherapy, which of course, cold water immersion is cheaper. Next icing strategy, hydrotherapy. Talk about the benefits of hydrotherapy. Of course, if you're on social media now, you know, cold plunge is all the rage. Ideally, you are not doing cold plunge after you train. But, you know, an hour and a half, two hours after and or before, then you should be good to go. You know, it's recommended in the morning because, again, just like the opposite of a hot shower and or a sauna at night, taking a cold plunge before bed, you're, it's a trigger to your body when you get out to raise temperature. And it's, so it's recommended to do it earlier in the day. But 
you know, we've had a number of people go through super athlete and, you know, I've had many times myself when I've done it later in the day and I've slept great. So find what works for you. Photo biomodulation, of course, that's light. The most recent meta analysis suggests that photo biomodulation might be more effective than various methods of cryotherapy, cold water immersion, or ice back application, but there hasn't been that many studies on it. So shout out to light, red light, juve light, orange light. And then they have stretching, active recovery, as the final two icing strategies where there's a high level of evidence in terms of being beneficial. Then it talks about sauna. Of course, there's been all kinds of evidence in terms of how sauna helps longevity, but the evidence in terms of helping recover has, there's just less evidence on that. The practice also imposes additional physiological stress on athletes, e.g. increased core temperature, heart rate, and sweat response and therefore it may hinder acute performance recovery as shown with swimmers. It looks like infrared sauna has been shown to benefit recovery, but it just, it looks like the research is just not that uh, in depth. Again, there's all kinds of health benefits for sauna. What we're talking about here is specifically for recovery. Recovery boots, sleeves, Normatec is the most common brand that's usually associated with these. And what this article recommends is based on the current level of evidence, it may be more feasible and cost effective to use other recovery strategies. Occlusion cuffs, blood flow restriction. Again, I'm a fan of using blood flow restriction as a training modality, not necessarily in recovery. And this paper seems to agree with the same thing. Blood flow restriction during recovery may add to the physiological stress response following training and should be considered in relation to the overall training. Stimulus float tank. They said there isn't much evidence on float tank, but you know, the few studies in this area report promising effects of floating on perceived muscle soreness, blood markers, fatigue, mood state, sleep, and some performance measures. We had Don Moxley on sports, uh, sports super athlete radio a few weeks ago. He's one of the world thought leaders on HRV heart rate variability. When he was working with Ohio state university, they had one of the top wrestling programs in the country and he was able to predict in the nationals who was going to, who was going to win, who was going to compete for a chance to win and who was going to get kicked out early, all based on HRV. And he said the number one modality to improve HRV in their experience was flow tank. So even though it doesn't say here, I would, uh, I trust in the trenches with Dawn that a uh, float tank is most definitely going to help with recovery. Massage guns. My 14 year old son loves his massage gun. This paper would say, slow down there, son. Given the lack of research and potential risk of misuse of massage guns, we suggest a cautious approach should be taken before, the, before further research can be performed. Psychosocial recovery, placebo and belief effects, and chronic use of recovery strategies. Okay. So just to put a nice piece of icing on the cupcake cupcake icing recovery modality is sleep, nutrition, periodization slash your training schedule in terms of how much volume, how intense, and what movements you are doing repeatedly and or in, you know, how spread out they are, are much bigger factors in terms of how quickly you recover compared to the, you know, the 12 to 15 modalities that we just mentioned. So hope you guys have found this episode of Super Athlete Radio uh, helpful. Uh, one other thing I want to say is we got a question in uh, Instagram DM last night in terms of, you know, who should I listen to when it comes to, you know, health and performance? Because I'm not liking what my doctor is saying and, I hear all these different perspectives on, uh, you know, from all these different coaches and teachers out in the world right now. And there's so many different voices and I'm hearing so many different things and it's so frustrating. Um, how do I know what, who to listen to? And it's a great question, but I think there's a completely different frame that you can put on that. And that frame is we live in, you know, the best time in history for you to really take control of your own uh, health and performance. And what I mean by that is, uh, 
you can you can order your own blood panel. You know, we offer blood panels here, but you don't even have to do go through Super Athlete or a company of, like us or your doctor. You can order it yourself in almost every state in the United States. And then see what your numbers say. Uh, bio, uh, biometric wearables, you know, whoop strap, heart rate variability. Well, we give away an ordering in uh, Super Athlete Training Camp to all our clients. And while the data is pretty, you know, it's pretty conclusive that it's not exact, you can know whether you start adding something or taking away something to your life. If, you're, if your data improves, then you know it's working for you. If it gets worse, then you know it's not working for you. So having access to that tool and then just one of the, even with all of the different tools and uh, data points that we have now for elite athletes uh, up until, I mean, we still do this now, uh, along with those tools, we are consistently asking them, how are you feeling today? How is your energy level? One to five. How was your sleep last night? And these subjective answers, while they are subjective, if you ask yourself that consistently, you are going to get a really good read on what's working for you and what's not. And then run the experiment. Run the experiment with a new type of training. Run the experiment with a new coach. Run the experiment with a new diet. Run the experiment with you know eliminating certain foods. Run the experiment with certain supplements. And see what works for you and see what doesn't. So, again, we live in a very special time in human history to really – Gain the insight and really take control of your body, your mind, so you could dominate everything that gets in your path. Dominate your industry, dominate your life. I'll see you guys at the next episode. Let's get better today.